Hi, everybody. My name is Adam Pick, and I'd like to welcome you to the webinar titled Advances in Bicuspid Aortic Valve Therapy. If I have yet to meet you, I am a patient and the founder of heartvalvesurgery.com. Our mission is very simple. We want to educate and empower, uh, empower patients just like you about heart valve disease. This webinar, which had over 400 registrations from patients in countries all over the world, is designed to support that mission. So you know, during the webinar, all participants are gonna be in what we call listen-only mode. That being said, you can submit questions during the webinar. Simply post your questions in the control panel on your screen. We will do our best to address your questions during the Q&A section at the end of the webinar. Lastly, we're gonna ask you to complete a very quick five question survey as this webinar wraps up. Now, I am thrilled, actually I'm beyond thrilled, to introduce you to the featured speakers for this session. Dr. Chris Malazri is a cardiac surgeon, professor of surgery, and co-director of the Bicuspid Aortic Valve Program at the Bloom Cardiovascular Institute at Northwestern Medicine. Dr. Jyothi Puthamana is a cardiologist, associate professor of medicine, and he is also a co-director of the Bicuspid Aortic Valve Program at Northwestern Medicine. So when it comes to Bicuspid Aortic Valves, to all my friends out there, we have got two of the leading and very talented clinicians on the phone with us today. And I could go on and on about the careers of Dr. Malazari and Dr. Puthamana and their special achievements in cardiac care. Instead, I will simply tell you this, that this team is celebrated by the bicuspid aortic valve patients at our heartvalvesurgery.com community. And I have to tell you why, it's for really, really good reason. Since launching this website, Northwestern, has successfully treated well over 100 patients from our community. And here you see some of the wonderful faces of people, including Tom Tansor, Gene Frank, Jim Whitney, Janice Kielbasa, and the list goes on and on and on. Personally, I'm humbled that Dr. Malazari and Dr. Puthamana are taking time away from their very busy practices at Northwestern to share their experiences and clinical research during this educational webinar. To start, I would like to introduce you all to Dr. Chris Malazari. Well, thank you very much, Adam, and welcome to all the participants today. We have a really exciting webinar, which is patient-focused, and over the next hour, we're gonna share with you what we've learned through our clinical and research mission in our bicuspid aortic valve program at Northwestern Medicine, which is made possible by a philanthropic grant from the Melman family. And again, my name is Chris Malasery. I'm a cardiac surgeon at Northwestern, downtown Chicago. I'm joined here by my colleague and good friend, Jyothi Puthamana, who's a cardiologist, uh, also downtown Chicago at uh, Bloom Cardiovascular Institute. And over the next our, our outline of the talk uh, will be an overview of bicuspid aortic valve uh, disease. And what a lot of people don't know is the accompanying disease of the aorta. So patients with bicuspid aortic valve will oftentimes have an associated aortic aneurysm. Uh, the second topic we'll be talking about will be treatment options for patients who have bicuspid aortic valve who then go on to develop disease because of the bicuspid aortic valve or because of aortic aneurysm. And finally, our last subject will focus on exciting research that we've been doing in bicuspid aortic valve and also give some recommendations on what to look for uh, for treatment options of the future. Um, and we'll finally finish it up with Q&A. Um, and I think that will round out the uh, last uh, bit of the hour that we have with you today. So going to uh, the third slide, Adam. 
I'll turn it over to Dr. Kuthamana, who will start with an overview of bicuspid aortic valves. <clears throat> thanks, uh, Chris. Thanks, Adam, again for having this, and uh, a special thanks to all the patients uh, who are uh, joining us today. Uh, we hope to cover uh, things that would be of interest and leave enough time so that we can address most of your questions that come up. Um, as uh, Adam and Chris mentioned, I'm a cardiologist uh, uh, with an interest and expertise with bicuspid valve disease uh, in the medical management of patients, and we, I work very closely with Chris uh, on the patients that we take care of together. So going on, uh, Adam, the next slide. So with most of you uh, who are signed on are very familiar with this, but just to kind of set the, uh, uh, set the ground for our discussion, uh, you're familiar that 98% of the patients of us are born with three leaflets in the aortic position, the main valve through which the heart pumps blood to the rest of the body. About 2% of us, slightly more in men than in women, uh, the leaflets do not separate at the time of birth, uh, leading to bicuspid valve, um, where two of the leaflets uh, instead of, uh, do not separate and uh, a patient is left with two leaflets in place of three uh, in the aortic position. Uh, next slide. And what, uh, what you would have been told uh, from your cardiologist or your primary doctor who has uh, looked at the echocardiogram or your valve is the different <clears throat> uh, type of morphology and it depends on which leaflet uh, did not separate at birth. And this uh, slide, what it uh, highlights is the, that most commonly what we see and what is reported in the literature is that uh, all of us are born with three leaflets called the right, left, and the non-coronary. And the most common uh, appearance or the most common morphology in a bicuspid valve is uh, uh, where the right and the left cusps are fused together. So if you look at this uh, particular image, the top left image, uh, which shows that 86% of uh, patients that we see and that have been reported in the literature have the most common right-left fusion pattern. Uh, what is shown there is the two coronary arteries, the arteries that take blood to the heart, uh, originate from the location of the right and the left cusp. And that again uh, comes into play uh, when we are talking about potential interventions and surgeries. Uh, uh, with bicuspid patients, and I think we can address that as we go down and as the questions come up. Um, and uh, the other point I just want to make from this slide is that the leaflets, as you see, are not equal. When patients have three leaflets, all three leaflets tend to be equal. Uh, as expected, when there is fusion of the leaflet, uh, the leaflet that is fused tends to be larger, and that comes into play when uh, we are talking of patients who may be candidates for certain therapies and for repair and so forth. And I see that there are uh, some of you who have asked questions regarding that that we'll address towards the end. Next slide. <clears throat> so uh, I mentioned this in the beginning, but uh, uh, two persons. So this is uh, reported to be the most common congenital abnormality. Um, uh, so two percent, if you are uh, like one of my colleagues from the children's hospital likes to say, if you're in a room with 100 people, it's likely that two of, uh, there's at least going to be two in that room who have a bicuspid valve. So it is a very common um, uh, uh, condition, um, more common in men uh, than in women. Like I mentioned, it's about one and a half times more common in men. Uh, so it is a common condition going on to the next slide. Uh, uh, what are the what are the uh, lifetime risks of having a bicuspid valve? And most of you are familiar with the three things that your cardiologist probably always talks to you about when they see you in clinic. Or if you are a new patient, these are the things that you should be educated about uh, regarding your valve. And the three things that happen to a bicuspid valve is narrowing of the valve or stenosis. Um, uh, the second uh, problem that can happen is regurgitation or leaking of the valve, where the valve does not close very well. Um, uh, and then the, because of the valve being an abnormal valve and the flow across it being abnormal, uh, patients are at risk for uh, infection. Again, that is a relatively uh, uncommon condition. 
but uh, we'll talk about some of the questions that have come up about when do you take antibiotics, what procedures mandate antibiotics and so forth. Uh, so this particular slide, it covers the gamut of the valve related problems that happen in patients with bicuspid valve disease. Uh, going on to the next slide, uh, these uh, uh, are the manifestations in about 40% of patients. We know, uh, luckily we have a lot of data in bicuspid valve patients over about 25 to 30 years of follow-up from uh, a couple of the large cohorts in the world. And what they have shown is about 40% of patients when followed up long enough uh, are likely to develop iotopathy. And what uh, what's meant uh, what, when, when your cardiologist says that you may, uh, that we are looking for iotopathy, they are looking for presence of an aneurysm. Uh, and as you see in this slide, uh, there are three different locations uh, where aneurysms tend to form with bicuspid aortic valve disease. Um, we will come specifically to questions of the implications of each, uh, but when they say that there is enlargement of the root, it is the part of the iota just above the valve that is enlarged, and usually it's the sinuses, the pockets into which the valve sits that are enlarged. Uh, the more common enlargement of the iota is the second image on this slide, uh, where it's the iota further up above the valve that is enlarged, uh, um, uh, called the ascending aortic dilation. Uh, it is kind of an important image to keep in mind uh, because some of these enlargements may not be picked up on an echocardiogram. As you see, this is further up on the aorta, uh, and you can again see in this image that the aortic enlargement is can be eccentric, meaning that the outer curvature as you see here, is a little larger than the inner curvature. So some of the measurements that are obtained just on an echocardiogram may not give us the definitive picture. And then we'll talk more about imaging modalities, whether it's an MRI or CT scan uh, for some patients. And uh, we'll come back to that. Uh, the third image on this slide is patients. Again, this is a, a less common manifestation, but where the enlargement of the iota is not limited to just the proximal, but extends into the arch. Uh, and uh, as you see, the arch is the candy cane of the iota, where the iota comes, takes a turn, and dips down. And that's an important part of the iota where all the blood vessels that take blood to your brain are present. Uh, and involvement of that part has significant implications in terms of surgical uh, uh, management, because some of the surgery is more involved and extensive including uh, blood flow to the brain. We will move on to the next slide, uh, which <clears throat> is one of the uh, maybe three important databases that exist in the literature. Uh, and we kind of use this uh, as a way to reassure our patients. And what you're seeing in this slide, this is from the experience of the Mayo Clinic that have been following close to about 400 or so patients over the last 25 years. Um, and what they, a lot of our knowledge kind of comes from uh, their experiences with how many patients develop stenosis, how many patients develop uh, regurgitation, how many need surgery, how many develop aneurysms, and how many develop the dreaded complication of a dissection. And what, what we know, the good news that has come from this and other databases is that as long as we know the diagnosis and as long as we follow patients carefully and closely, Patients with the bicuspid aortic valve disease tend to have the same uh, life expectancy as someone who does not have a bicuspid aortic valve disease. So I think the, the key take home from uh, this slide that I hope all of you will get is that uh, it is a common diagnosis. It is a diagnosis that has important implications uh, for life, but as long as uh, one is aware of it, and uh, follows it up closely along the outcomes are as good as someone without a bicuspid valve. Uh, going on to the next slide, uh, which <clears throat> uh, goes on from uh, what are the long-term uh, uh, long term expectation of the bicuspid valve is what is the role for family screening? Um, so we know that we, uh, we 
I mentioned in the initial slide that the, the prevalence was 2%. And we know from a couple of studies that have looked at families of patients with a bicuspid valve that a first degree relative bicleod is maybe five to seven times more. Uh, so one of the things that we routinely tell when we see a patient for the first time is we kind of get a detailed history about their siblings, about their children, uh, about their parents, uh, just to make sure that we emphasize the fact that this runs in families. Uh, and if a patient has a diagnosis of a bicuspid valve, that we uh, uh, want to make sure that their children are screened um, and uh, the screening is uh, uh, traditionally by an echocardiogram. Uh, as you see here on this moving image on the right, that is an image of a bicuspid valve uh, where, and this is a nicely functioning uh, valve where the two, the fused and the non-fused leaflet are about the same size. So, um, uh, so the screening uh, is a simple 45 minute to a one hour ultrasound of the heart. Uh, just like an ultrasound uh, in a, a, a mother who's pregnant. Uh, and uh, it, it gives us all the information. So either someone has it or it does not have it. So it's a one one time. And uh, uh, this is something that's recommended by the American College of Cardiology, by the American Heart Association, and the American Academy of Pediatrics. So it's kind of a uh, important take-home message that among the patients who have this, you should... Uh, encourage your family members, specifically your children and your siblings, to have an echocardiogram, which is the only way to make a diagnosis. Uh, just an auscultation will not suffice. Going on to the next screen, um, I will briefly touch. I I'm, I'll kind of hand over back to Chris for the surgical treatment options on bicuspid valve. Well, thanks, Jyoti. I'll uh, continue with the treatment options. And uh, before I start with all the treatment options, it's really important for the patients to know that the treatment options very much depend on why the bicuspid aortic valve is diseased. So if it's tight or calcified, or if it's uh, stretched out and leaky, or if uh, by uh, some unfortunate event becomes infected, these all determine what sort of treatment options that we choose for our patients, because there are several to think about. And the first one to think about, um, Adam, you go to the next slide. Uh, the first one, which is probably the most important one, is uh, if we were to replace the diseased aortic valve, what would the patient want for an artificial valve? So here are two artificial valves in broad categories. The one on the left is a tissue valve. So you see that the leaflets of that tissue valve uh, are made of either cow or pig. So they either come in two varieties. Both are tissue valves. The one on the right is a mechanical valve and uh, it's actually not metal. Uh, it's mechanical in that it's made out of a uh, pure carbon. So uh, these do not set off alarms in the airport. Uh, but these are extremely durable. Um, and that is the main benefit of mechanical valve is its durability, because that uh, high-grade carbon will never break, it never fractures, um, it will always open close as the way it should. But the downside of the mechanical valve is that patients have to be maintained on a blood thinner. Um, and the single book there's only one blood thinner that's available for mechanical valves, and that's called warfarin or coumadin. And uh, that's a once a day pill that has to be monitored with uh, blood levels. So um, on the one hand, the mechanical valve is durable, but you have to be on uh, long-term uh, blood thinners. Now the tissue valve, on the other hand, uh, does not need to be maintained on long-term blood thinners but the durability isn't quite as good as mechanical valve. So patients, especially young patients, will be looking at a reoperation in the future. And uh, this is, this is uh, such an important question to answer right off the bat that uh, I recommend that you talk very closely with both your cardiologists and your cardiac surgeons to determine which is the right valve for you. Next slide, Adam. 
The second operation that we do for uh, patients with bicuspid aortic valve or uh, for patients who have an aneurysm with their bicuspid aortic valve, uh, in which case we have to replace the aorta and the valve at the same time, so otherwise known as the aortic root replacement. And that is what probably most surgeons would offer patients with bicuspid aortic valve with an aneurysm is the Bentel procedure, named after a surgeon named Hugh Bentel. And that's a complete root replacement with a valve and the aorta. What a lot of people don't know is that the bicuspid aortic valve oftentimes can be spared and even repaired. So patients with leaky, stretched out valves are good candidates for a valve repair. And that is called a valve sparing aortic root replacement uh, or the David procedure. Uh, next slide. And this is a schematic of the total root replacement, otherwise known as the Bentol procedure. Uh, that in this procedure, both the aortic valve is removed, the aneurysm is also removed, and it is replaced with this conduit. The conduit is constructed of either a tissue or a mechanical valve attached to a Dacron graft. Uh, the Dacron is a textile. It's woven in a machine into a perfect tube, and that is the replacement part for the valve in the aorta. Next slide, Adam. Now, the valve sparing aortic root replacement um, is a procedure where the valve is deconstructed from the aortic root. So we keep the we keep the bicuspid aortic valve and we can repair it if it's leaky. The aneurysm is completely resected and the bicuspid aortic valve is pulled up into the Dacron graft where it's resuspended and able to function normally again. So that accomplishes the uh, uh, the two goals of restoring a normal bicuspid aortic valve while replacing the aortic aneurysm. So this is a specialized procedure, the David procedure. Um, and look for um, tertiary care centers or centers of expertise who would be able to offer this procedure for, um, for your particular problem. Next slide, please. Another procedure I think Adam is very familiar with is the Ross procedure. Uh, this procedure uh, involves replacing the aortic valve with a patient's pulmonary valve. So the first step is to replace, is to remove the diseased aortic valve, and then take the patient's pulmonary valve, which is right next to the aortic valve on the heart, and then put that pulmonary valve in the aortic position. And you may ask, well, what happens to that um, area in the pulmonary valve? It's no longer there. Well, that valve is then replaced what we call a homograft. And what that is, is a cadaveric pulmonary valve. Um, so this, if you, um, if you pay very close attention, is a complex procedure. It takes longer to do than a simple aortic valve replacement. And it is, in fact, a double valve procedure. Uh, but these procedures, I think, are very good procedures for young patients with non-repairable bicuspid aortic valves where um, artificial valves are not the ideal situation for those patients. So there's a special uh, case for these Ross procedures too. Next, next slide. A few words on minimum invasive and um, transcatheter procedure. The approach I think is very important. I recently had a patient who was 55 years old. I think one of uh, one of the patients on heart valve surgery, as a matter of fact, was an executive and really needed to get back to work as soon as possible. Uh, the approach for open heart surgery is what most people think of on the left, is an up and down incision, dividing the breastbone, exposing the entire heart. Um, in fact, many times, if it's just a simple aortic valve replacement, the approach can be done minimally invasive. So with a keyhole incision, uh, either through a upper hemisternotomy seen on the right, or my favorite approach, which is in the middle, a mini thoracotomy, which is a keyhole incision between the ribs, uh, we can still do open heart surgery, remove the aortic valve, and replace it either with a tissue or mechanical valve. And um, 
that particular patient I was talking about earlier had a very short length of stay in the hospital, three days, and he was able to return to work in about two weeks. So the minimally invasive procedure, I think, affords a, a very quick recovery. Next slide. Now, there are some patients uh, that are high risk for any sort of open heart surgery, and we're talking 70 or 80-year-old patients with medical problems that can uh, inhibit a normal recovery after standard cardiac surgery. And these patients, TAVR, transcatheter aortic valve replacement, is an option for bicuspid aortic valves with aortic stenosis. And here is a procedure, um, here is a diagram illustrating that procedure. The valve is delivered through the artery in the leg through a, a small puncture site, no incision. Cardiopulmonary bypass or the heart lung machine is not required for this procedure. The valve is crimped on a thin catheter. And once we deliver the valve into place inside the heart, then we briefly pace the heart in order to keep it from pumping blood. And then we can inflate a balloon or deploy the valve uh, into position where it functions as it should on the right there, fully deployed. So this is an option, I think, for high-risk patients. I mean, my final slide for treatment op my final slide for treatment options is next. Um, and uh, I will, uh, Jyoti will finish with this part. Um, we'll, uh, Jyoti will tell you about our exciting research that we've been conducting um, at um, Bloom Cardiovascular Institute uh, in collaboration with our children's hospital directly across the street and in fact connected by uh, Sky Bridges, the um, Lurie Children's Hospital in downtown Chicago. Uh, and also with the help of Aaron Crawford, who is our bicuspid aortic valve uh, nurse coordinator. I'll turn it over to Josie in a second, but I think there's one take home slide after this. Not quite. All right. So it's at the end, right? Yeah. All right. Okay. Okay. So thanks. So we'll come back to Chris has another slide regarding uh, the surgical options, uh, the take home slide regarding surgical options. I'll uh, briefly for the next maybe four slides talk about uh, the research that is happening here. Uh, uh, Dr. Fedak, one of the cardiac surgeons who used to be with us here is uh, and now uh, is in Calgary and has been on uh, Adam Pick's uh, uh, site before, uh, does uh, most of our uh, basic science work with resected tissue uh, and combines it with uh, some of our MRI imaging uh, to uh, so some of you may have seen publications from here that include uh, the characterization of tissue in bicuspid valve and some of the kind of front forefront in research. Uh, Chris talked about our uh, we have a bridge program mainly uh, with the goal of uh, transitioning children between the ages of 16 to 26 who have been in the care of a pediatric cardiologists across the street uh, as they transition uh, to adult care. And uh, most of the patients that we are seeing uh, at this clinic are patients who have uh, mostly had procedures done as infants or as children, whether it's a narrowed valve or an aneurysm repair, and may need uh, a repeat evaluation and potential surgery or procedure in the future. So the main goal of this bridge uh, program is to transition patients and to follow them very closely. Um, uh, Adam, next slide. So the, the goal of, uh, we have a comprehensive uh, bicuspid valve program that in addition to the medical, uh, the surgical, the pediatric component has, uh, and uh, Dr. Fedak, the basic science component, uh, we have the radiology um, uh, and uh, cardiac MRI component to it. Um, uh, and uh, as Chris mentioned, Erin Crawford is our uh, nurse coordinator who helps coordinate our uh, research and clinical program. Uh, so the main goal of uh, the research over the past uh, close to a decade, but maybe seven, eight years, has been to have patients with bicuspid aortic valve disease and to look at what, what are the manifestations of disease <clears throat> and are we able to uh, better uh, uh, identify or better uh, 
triage patients into different categories as to those who are likely to progress versus those who are not, looking for new uh, markers of uh, a disease that can progress faster or slower. Uh, and I think this will come up again during the question session. So if you uh, add them to the next slide, uh, what has been shown by research uh, done from here uh, uh, are um, uh, a few things. So here is looking at the imaging piece of things and how it correlates with the actual tissue abnormalities seen in bicuspid valve. So what we see in these two images on the left is the I had talked about the common fusion patterns that are seen in a bicuspid valve. And what we see in these two images is depending on how the bicuspid orifice is oriented, the flow across the valve uh, has a predominant effect on different parts of the iota. Uh, and um, a lot of the work that has been done by our colleagues in uh, uh, radiology and cardiac MRI have tried to identify the different um, morphology and to see if it is able to better characterize patients about the location of the most abnormality. So uh, what you're seeing here in red is the location of the highest uh, stress on the iota and the thinking is that may be the region that is likely to progress uh, over a course of time. Um, on, to the, on to the next slide, actually sh the videos that uh, will play here <coughs> show these images that you're seeing um, are uh, images from um, the 4D flow imaging. So essentially what um, uh, what the colleagues, Dr. Uh, Michael Markle and Alex Barker on this particular paper, what they have been able to do is to uh, tag flow across the aortic valve uh, to the aorta. And what you see on the left image is a normal tri-leaflet aortic valve. And you can see that when you tag the flow along, the flow tends to be nice and laminar. Um, the highest velocity of flow is right at the center, uh, and then the uh, velocity decreases as you go along to the peripheries, indicated by the greens and the yellows. And the right image shows a patient with a bicuspid aortic valve, uh, and you can see on the uh, image that the valve is opening well. So this is not a valve that is either narrowed um, or is a valve that's leaking. But in spite of that, what you appreciate with this new with this technology that is available is that the flow across the valve tends to be very eccentric and uh, the flow has different uh, effects on the different locations of the iota uh, and there is a lot of work uh, that has been done locally here over the last uh, close to a decade but at least the last seven eight years uh, showing uh, the benefit of this additional 4d flow imaging uh, in being able to uh, stratify bicuspid patients uh, with and without aneurysms into different subgroups and their family members. Uh, the next slide takes our research to a next step. And I, I talked about uh, Dr. Fidak and the collaboration that we have. And what, uh, if you uh, look on the left side um, uh, image, uh, what he among our patients uh, who have, who are part of the study, who have had to have uh, the aneurysm resected by Dr. Malajri, what we have seen, and in th these are all patients who have undergone MRIs and MRIs with 4D flow imaging prior to their resection. And what we've been able to show is that what we see on the MRI as areas of high impact, high stress, are the areas of the iota that are more uh, disintegrated, disorganized. Uh, so what you see on the left screen are patients where the wall, the WSS is wall shear stress. So these are uh, parts of the iota that do not have much stress as indicated by MRI where the tissue architecture seems to be intact. In contrast, the part of the iota that has more wall shear stress as identified by MRI non-invasively are the parts of the iota that when looked under the electron microscope uh, shows more tissue disintegration. And uh, uh, Dr. Fidak has then gone on to show 
presence of some of the tissue biomarkers that indicate uh, higher likelihood of elastin and other uh, tissue breakdown. So we've kind of taken it from a non-invasive imaging standpoint onto the lab to show that what we are seeing uh, has a role um, in being able to identify patients who have more tissue disintegration. Um, and I think, Adam, there's one more slide before we go on to questions. Uh, was there one closing slide? Yeah, and why don't we go to the questions and answers. I know we probably have some uh, pretty good questions with them. Um, the uh, patients are very well educated and I get some excellent questions in clinic. So why don't we go straight to those then? Yeah, sounds great, Dr. Malazri. And, and before we get there, I just want to thank you and Dr. Puthamana, uh, the entire Northwestern team for all the great work you're doing there, whether it's on the diagnostic side, the management of the patients with bicuspid aortic valve, and geez, all the different treatment options you have, and then the research, uh, really compelling and fascinating. And I know I've been taking notes and learning a whole lot through this entire experience. And you're right, we have gotten um, a flood of questions from the patients. And um, so why don't we get right into them? The first one is coming in from Celine, and she asks a great question. If you are born with a bicuspid aortic valve, is aortic stenosis and surgery inevitable? Thanks, Celine, for asking this question on behalf of all the uh, patients. Um, a very important question and very important since 2% of us have a bicuspid valve. So it's kind of very important to know how many are going to end up needing a surgery. So what we know from studies that have now been following patients longer than 30, 35 years uh, is that close to half the patients, anywhere from 45 to 50% of patients will end up needing surgery in their lifetime if they are born with a bicuspid valve. That is number one. Number two, what is the usual uh, timing of surgery? Most of the patients end up uh, needing a surgery somewhere in the 50 to 60 age group. There are obviously children that we see who have had surgery very young, and we've also seen patients much older than that. Number three, and your question specifically addresses this, is aortic stenosis. And that's an important point to make because that is the most common manifestation of bicuspid aortic valve disease. Um, uh, so patients, we know that aortic stenosis is degeneration of the aortic valve that causes calcium to build up and restricts the valve opening. That can happen to all of us as we get older, even with the normal three leaflet valve. But those of, with the bicuspid valve, it tends to happen maybe 15 years or even 20 years earlier than it would happen in a patient who does not have a bicuspid valve. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, I hope that helped you, Celine. I know it helped me. Uh, moving on to the next question is from Steve, and it's all about this idea of tissue valve reoperations for cuspid aortic valve patients. Uh, Steve asks, I received a tissue valve and an arch replacement four years ago. As a 60-year-old male, is this advantageous if, when the valve needs to be replaced? Steve asked a great question here because he has a tissue valve and durability um, uh, is a concern for younger patients, but I think he rightly chose a tissue valve at his, his age group. Uh, we estimate that a 60-year-old patient who takes a tissue valve, they have a durability of about 15 to 20 years with that tissue valve, so that's pretty good. But where does that leave Steve when he's 75 or 80 years old? Should the valve need to be replaced? I think he's very well positioned for a valve and valve procedure. The valve and valve procedure is a transcatheter procedure. So the next operation for Steve does not have to be repeat open heart surgery. So this is a TAVR procedure where we deliver the valve through the groin and the tissue valve stent becomes a very good landing zone for the TAVR valve. So he's very well positioned should he need the valve replaced for transcatheter procedure in the future. Great. Moving on to a question from Ron. He asks, what size aneurysm would the, doctorate, would the doctors operate if my bicuspid aortic valve is functioning normally? 
So Ron is concerned about his aortic aneurysm, and rightly so, because aneurysms, as they grow, have a greater risk of rupture or dissection, which are uh, aortic emergencies. And we know that 50% of patients with bicuspid aortic valves have an associated aortic aneurysm. So that's part of our research is determine what size is the appropriate size. But guideline recommendations say that we should never let the aortic aneurysm get above 5.5 centimeters. So that is one number that, that Ron should remember. Uh, in many centers, including ours, uh, there are centers of excellence who can offer an aortic root replacement with low operative risk, meaning that um, the patients uh, don't have to uh, worry about complications from this procedure. Then uh, 5.0 centimeters is another threshold number where we think about offering a preventive aortic uh, surgery in order to prevent aortic catastrophes. Great. The next question comes in from Melinda about risk factors for BAV. And she says, what can I do to avoid surgery for my bicuspid aortic valve? Should I control my weight and blood pressure? Thanks, Melinda, for asking. This is, uh, uh, in my clinic, this is kind of the most important question that patients ask as to how best can they take care of the valve to either delay or postpone or hopefully never need surgery. So what we know is that the risk factors that predispose patients to the, for the valve to get calcified and narrowed, uh, causing aortic stenosis, are uh, mostly the same risk factors that also are present in patients who develop blockages in the arteries of the heart uh, and uh, atherosclerosis. So what we know is patients who have higher cholesterol, who have higher blood pressure, who smoke, uh, who are who are overweight? These are all the risk factors that could increase the speed at which the valve can calcify. Having said that, there uh, you really don't have too much control. Or in spite of having all optimal risk factors, if your cholesterol levels are ideal, if your blood pressure is ideal, your valve can still degenerate just because it is a bicuspid valve. Just as we saw in the cartoons and the images and the echoes. The flow across this valve is what damages the margins of the valve. And when that valve margin damages, there is calcium that deposits there that causes the valve uh, to degenerate. The newer research into this looks at specific cholesterol markers. There is a, some of you may have had blood tests done looking at lipoproteins. The thinking that if patients have elevated lipoprotein, uh, a specific one called LP little a, this may be patients whose valve may uh, calcify a little faster and there may be a role to lower the cholesterol even if the cholesterol values are close to normal. Uh, but studies that have looked at lowering cholesterol with cholesterol medication in large groups of patients have not shown a decrease in progression. So I think it's kind of a long-winded answer to your question. but uh, a uh, healthy lifestyle definitely can delay your progression, but not uh, prevent it altogether. Great. The next question comes in from Jean, and I, we get this question all the all the time. Since my BAV replacement, I have developed infections and two teeth implants. Is this significant? What should I do to prevent this? Uh, thanks for this question. And usually, patients kind of have questions uh, in two ways. One is since I have a bicuspid valve, do I need to do anything different when I go to the dentist? But in your case, this, it looks like it may be coincidental that you are having more problems with the implants and with the teeth following your surgery. The uh, uh, replacement of your bicuspid valve, irrespective of the type of valve and the concomitant medications that you're taking, should not by itself have caused you to have more gum disease or uh, uh, or infection in the mouth. Having said that, it is extremely important uh, that uh, the, any oral infection is well treated and addressed. And we, in fact, right when we uh, see our patient for the first time on, we re-emphasize the need for extremely good dental hygiene, both on a regular basis and visits to the dentist every uh, at least twice a year. And we know that most of the time when patients end up 
having an infection on the valve. The common organism is usually an organism that's present in the mouth. Uh, so we have good data to show that poor dental hygiene uh, predisposes patients to the risk of getting an infection on the valve. So uh, dental hygiene is key and very important part of taking care of your bicuspid valve. Great, and the questions just keep coming in. This is an, uh, a really great discussion topic uh, uh, about this TAVR versus uh, Saver. And Joe asks, I'm a 62-year-old bicuspid aortic valve patient. Are there any activity restrictions for a person with a TAVR place valve versus a Saver? This is um, a question for patients um, who are recovering from either procedure. And uh, the great thing about the uh, TAVR procedure is that the recovery is so quick. Um, and Joe is only 62 years, years old, but I've seen 80-year-old patients get the TAVR procedure and be home within one to two days um, with exercise restrictions of only one to two weeks and back to the golf course or tennis court where they really want to be. Um, and that's a lot faster than uh, for surgical aortic valve replacement. Um, but I think for a 62-year-old patient with bicuspid aortic valve, I would take a really close look at a minimally invasive open heart procedure, uh, meaning we can do open heart procedure where we remove the bicuspid aortic valve and replace it with either a mechanical or tissue valve through a keyhole incision. Um, in those sort of cases, we can be home within three to five days from the hospital and back um, to normal activity in about two weeks. Uh, so for Joe, I think um, both procedures are, op are uh, available to Joe, but probably minimally invasive aortic valve replacement would be the preferred choice for him uh, because he's bicuspid. Great. And the next question comes in from Judy about symptoms associated with BAV. She asked, I have bicuspid aortic valve. Should I be concerned when I get heart palpitations, twinges, or short periods of pain in my chest? Judy, thanks for asking the question. Um, it is uh, very important. So the, as we had mentioned in the beginning, there are three manifestations in bicuspid aortic valve disease, either narrowing of the valve, stenosis, leaking of the valve, regurgitation, or aortic aneurysm. The first two conditions, whether it's a narrowing of the valve or a leaking of the valve, eventually will cause symptoms and mostly patients complain of feeling short of breath initially with exercise but shortness of breath that can progress indicating that the valve is uh, getting into more trouble uh, patients can have palpitations uh, if there is extra workload on the heart uh, the aneurysm is one um, uh, a condition where patients can continue to have enlargement of the aneurysm without significant manifestation of symptoms. So I think for your specific situation, what is important uh, that you are educated on is what is happening to my bicuspid valve? How is it mild, moderate, or severely stenotic? Is it mild, moderate, or severely regurgitant? What is the size of my aneurysm? Once you have all that information about uh, you should be able to tease out whether the symptoms could be coming from your bicuspid valve uh, or if it's independent and if it's from some other uh, issue from a heart standpoint, but may not be from the bicuspid valve. Got it. And we have time for one or two more questions. And I'm going to jump to this question that came in from William about the use of a homograph. He says, is it common that a homograph is used for bicuspid aortic valve replacements? Why or why not? It sounds like William has done homework on uh, valve choice. And uh, homograph now is not being as commonly used as before in elective cases. And the reason is because uh, tissue valves uh, constructed from animal parts, so the pig and cow valves, have just become so durable with newer and newer technology that homographs, which are uh, human um, aortic valves, are used less and less. But there is one particular case where we do use homograph, and those are cases where the bicuspid aortic valve patient develops an infection in the heart valve, which we call endocarditis. 
Sometimes those in infections can be fairly destructive in the heart, uh, in which case we would need to use a homograft in order to reconstruct the damage that has been done by the bacteria as well as replace the valve. So homograft is less used in elective cases, but still commonly used for heart valve infections. Great, and we're gonna jump to a question. I know that is, uh, well actually maybe we can squeeze in uh, two more about what, how about mechanical valve replacements? Tom asks, I'd like to have a one and done procedure so I'm thinking about a mechanical valve when I need surgery. Uh, will mechanical valves always need patients to be on blood thinners? Yeah, Tom asks a really exciting research question and I'd like to tell the whole group that uh, blood thinners for mechanical valves is constantly changing. So right now, mechanical valves have to be maintained on the blood thinner called Coumadin or Warfarin. Uh, one recent advance is with the Cryolife Onyx valve is that the Coumadin level can be lower than standard Coumadin levels. So that's, that's the new, uh, that's the new um, breakthrough that's happened recently. Now, there are currently studies going on looking at alternatives to Coumadin, um, particularly a, a particular trial called the PROACT-10A trial, which is listed on clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, we will be participating in that trial as well. And that trial is designed to look at alternatives to Coumadin we call um, DOAX or NOAX, so uh, direct oral anticoagulants, um, which uh, we've found to be safer in conditions such as atrial fibrillation and blood clots, but has not yet been tested in mechanical valves until now. So this PROACT 10A trial will be looking at newer anticoagulations um, for mechanical valves. I think it's gonna be a really exciting option for patients in the future if the trial is positive. Great, well with that exciting re uh, response, uh, we're gonna go ahead and conclude the webinar, but please, please don't exit the webinar just yet. On behalf of the entire community at heartvalvesurgery.com and all the patients with valve disease, I'd like to extend an extraordinary thank you to Dr. Malazri and Dr. Puthamana for sharing their expertise with us today. As we end the, as we end the web webinar, I'd like to also thank you all the attendees for your participation in this community event and your support of heartvalvesurgery.com. And lastly, as we close this webinar, I'd like to ask you to complete a really quick survey that is about to appear on your screen. Dr. Puthamana, Dr. Malazi, thank you so much for your time. And as we always say here, keep on ticking. <laughs>